Hey everybody, welcome to this free edition of our Trader Use Group Weekly Roundup for the trading week ending July 24th, 2022. I'm Preston Brent, thanks for tuning in. Well, this week's theme is, is this another dead cat bounce or are we gonna go higher? Well, let's kind of take a look at where we've been and then just kind of like take a look at some of the key economic data, um, both here in the US and uh, across the globe. And then we'll take a look at the charts and just kind of see how things are shaping up for this all important week coming up. So if we look at this past week, you can see here that everybody was solid in the green. I mean, everybody, the strongest performer was the Russell small cap, then NASDAQ, then S&P, then the Dow. Still solidly in the red for the year, but a really strong bounce week. Um, best performing sector for the week was discretionary, up huge 6.84%. Utilities bringing up the rear in a typical risk on type of uh, week. And then sector performance uh, annually, energy still leading the way, a little over almost 31% for the year. Communication services really plunged and took over the leadership to the downside from discretionary, being down 27.5% roughly. And you can see the uh, forward PE ratio sitting right at about 17.12, around the 10-year uh, average, slightly lower than the eight of, um, five-year average. You can see the um, dividend yield is coming in at 1.64, 10-year treasury finished out the week at 278. Treasury is still about 114 bips higher than the dividend yield, but the earnings yield for the S&P is still a solid 5.17%. And the S&P yield over the Treasury is 2.39%. The real yield is still a negative 3.93, looking at inflation running at about 9.1% or a little bit higher. And then volatility, you can see it was down just about 5% for the week. The prior week, it closed at 24.23. This week, 23.03. So all in all, the market had a very solid week, okay? Um, we saw, and I saw this week, that the sentiment in the market has just reached extreme levels, really unsustainable levels. So a bounce is normal, which we had um, a strong breath in this bounce, but we also probably had some short squeezes going on as well. Um, and we're also getting uh, Q2 earnings, many of them showing that the economy is slowing, but not as much as some of the um, analysts were predicting. So all in all, sentiment eased off just a little bit and the 10-year Treasury backed off. It was, I mean, it's hard to believe just about a, a, a month ago, it was up over 3.5%. Now it's down to 2.78%. Um, and you may be saying, why is the 10-year coming down when interest rates are going up with the Fed? And that's because the vote of confidence going into the end of this year, into 2023, is not as good. So on the longer end of the yield curve, we're seeing these rates come back a little bit. And on the um, economic data front, uh, jobless claims uh, did come in above expectations. In fact, it hit its highest level in nine months. And then manufacturing in the mid-Atlantic region actually fell to its low, lowest level since the pandemic. Okay, and housing data is also disappointing with um, sentiment in the housing market, not too good. Mortgage rates still up, although off the highs. Um, so we got to watch this very closely, um, you know, and just kind of see how it is. And if we look at the treasury market, as I said, the 10-year treasury is down to about 2.73% roughly. 2.78, 2.73, somewhere in that area. Um, as we went into close, it was 2.78. It's the lowest level it's been in about two months, okay? Um, and the Fed Fund Futures is pricing in a year-end rate uh, of about 35 to 3.75%. And there's a 90% probability they're going to hike the rates 75 basis points this coming week, okay? Um, now, <clears throat> understand that this coming week, we got some really key uh, things hitting. On uh, Thursday, we get the first pass of Q2 GDP. And market analysts are forecasting it's going to come in at 1.6%. What's really interesting is the Atlanta Fed now gauge says it's going to come in at a minus 1.6%. Keep in mind, the first quarter did come in at a minus 1.6%. So this is going to be very closely watched to see if we're already in a recession or it's just going to be a, a mild pullback uh, within this bear market in a soft landing. We got to watch this very closely. Okay. Now, 
of course, if we if we shift over uh, and look at Europe, look at the ECB, you see everybody's in the green over there in Europe from Euro stocks, FTSE, CAC 40 and the DAX all solidly in the green. Year to date, everybody's in the red. All right. Um, the ECB did raise their rates by 50 basis points this past week, um, and they're starting very late in the game. That was a larger than expected adjustment by the ECB. Most people were expecting 25 basis points, and they came out with a new policy tool that they, I love the names they give these things, they call this the transmission protection instrument, which is a measure that's designed to reduce the variance and the delta between lending costs in, say, Southern Europe and Northern Europe, specifically Italy and Greece versus Germany. Germany is considered the benchmark. Ten-year boond, um, that's always the lowest rate of any treasury over there in Europe. And the highest tends to be more of the socialistic countries like Greece or Italy. So they're going to try and keep those rates fairly close together. And essentially what that means is uh, the ECB can come in and buy um, treasuries, um, government debt in Italy or, or Greece, wherever it surfaces, and maybe sell government debt in areas like Germany where it's a lot lower, right? So I'm sure this is going to be really interesting to see how it all plays out. But ECB, all of Europe is hurting a lot more so than the U.S. Their manufacturing PMI fell below 50 in June to 49.6. That shows contraction, all right? And it was at a little over 52 in May. Now, the services side is a little bit stronger, but not much. It's almost just slightly above break even at 50.6, but it came down from 53, right? So the consumer confidence in Europe is very low. They got problems with uh, Russia. They Russia restarted their Nord Stream gas flows to Europe, but only at 30% of ca uh, capacity. So they're fearing that that could really create more uh, discomfort and pain and economic uh, downward projections if Russia just turns it off, auto, uh, all of it off, really. Um, so you got those issues going on. Meanwhile, in the UK, inflation came in year over year at 9.4% in June. That was up from 9.1 in May. So they're having huge inflation issues also. So this is a global phenomenon. I don't think you can turn economies off and turn them back on and not expect any kind of consequences. And that's what we're getting. Then, of course, if we zoom over to the Asian markets, look at um, Japan, they left their short-term uh, uh, interest rate policy unchanged at a minus 10 basis points, um, and they're still maintaining their long-term yield target, and they're still maintaining their stimulus and their asset purchase program, all right? They're still trying to get to 2% inflation, and they've been trying to get there for decades now. But they also, in, in, um, in their meeting, they downgraded their forecast for economic growth to 2.4% year over year, and that was from an earlier forecast of 2.9. Just like Europe, they're downgrading their economy, so this is not going to be very pretty. Meanwhile, in China, um, they issued a growth target of about 5.5% for 2022 this year. I don't believe it. A lot of the data coming out of there is just not good um, or it's manipulated. And the People's Bank of China rate uh, maintain their current interest rate policy at 3.7%. China's uh, real estate market is starting to blow up, too. You may have read reports where a lot of people have just stopped. They're stopping paying their mortgage. There's a big real estate problem over there. I think eventually that's going to blow up. And while I don't see a contagion effect near term, if the entire market just capitulates, then there will be some contagion over to Europe and then over here to our shores here in the U.S. So we got to watch it closely just to see how things are shaping back up. What I'm going to do is shift you over to the uh, indexes. Let's just go over and take a look at the, uh, the market movement here. And I want to show a couple of key things for you here. It's going to take a couple of seconds for this thing to come on the screen for you guys. Uh, but or you, what you're going to be looking at is the E-mini S&P 500 futures. Okay. Um, and if you look at this, you can see the 50 EMA is playing a prominent role. And if I blow it, let's just get rid of the bottom uh, gauge here and blow it up. You can see here where intraday we move below the 50 EMA, but we managed to move back up and close above it, but slightly, but on a down day. You can see the prior day we closed pretty much right on the 50 EMA. And the day before that, pretty much right on the 50 EMA. And the day before that, so it's not surprising that the 50 EMA is playing a key role. If you look at the data here, it had a hard time getting over the 50 EMA before it rolled back over again. Okay, 
So we got to watch it very closely. Um, and if we just come in here and look at it, our lows, our last low was June 17th. We were down 24.32%, right, over here. My target had originally been around 3730. Our members know my my longer range target, which I think we're going to fall into before the end of the year. Our members will go through this a little bit more detail um, Sunday night for our weekly market watch session. But you can see here, if we fall back below the 50 EMA, that's not going to be a good thing. These railroad tracks here is a rare gap and a gap down in the E-mini futures. And you can see where the gap is just pretty much provided resistance. Now, we exceeded the gap. We moved up. Typically, when you do this, I would expect a retest of this area. So if we come down and retest this gap area slightly below the, the 3,900 level. Now, remember, we closed at 3,963. So that would assume another 60 to 75 points lower uh, in the markets to test this level. Um, and then once we test this, if we move back up, that will be a very bullish sign. And I think you'll see a, a stronger move than what we got right here so far. Again, we got all these key data coming out next week. Um, in addition to the Feds uh, and the first pass of Q2 GDP, uh, we're going to get Microsoft uh, on earnings on uh, Tuesday. And then Wednesday, we get Facebook. We also get Boeing. That'll be interesting. Thursday, we get Apple and Amazon. Uh, and then we also see MasterCard, which is a good uh, barometer of consumer spending. So there's going to be some big mega, mega cap hitting the uh, wires this week and that could also move the markets depending on what we what we see so all in all it's going to be a very interesting market uh and we're going to see some movement in it if we look at nasdaq you're going to see it was down 211 on friday but we did manage to get over our uh, 50 ema and then we tested it as we always do the next day or the day after i think we're going to come back down and test it again you can see our low for the year we were down almost 34%. So I think it was maybe a bit overdone too quickly, but we're going to try and see if this this move up has some legs. Not really sure yet, but we're going to watch it very closely. And again, we, we got a bear market chart across all U.S. indexes. And a bear market chart, even if we're not down 20%, um, signifies that the 50s below the 200 and then you get price movement based on that meaning typically if price is below the 50 it's going to come up and test the 50 and then possibly roll over or if it rules through the 50 and we get some follow through then the next test is the 200. until we can clear all this up it's still a bear market chart so we've got to be very careful and of course if we look at the russell you're going to see the russell also moved above the 50 EMA. We came right down to my target. Remember, we were down uh, about 33 and a third percent for the year. Kind of hit my second target. That was my first target. I reduced it a little bit lower here. Um, and you can see we're tested the 50 EMA as a intraday low on Friday, and then we slightly moved up above it, okay? And then, of course, if we come over and look at the Dow and just kind of see across all indexes, you can see the Dow is the same. They're all hovering around the 50 EMA. So if we give it up early in the week leading into the Fed meeting, um, and then let's say the Feds either do a surprise or they come in a little bit more aggressive, even if they do 75 basis points, but if Boom Boom Powell in his press conference is more aggressive in his statements and his answers, we're going to come back down again. We're going to roll right back over. So we've got to be very careful. As I've been telling our members, this is a time to be careful. Um, if we look at the skew, uh, in the front month volatility, you can see we're in the green, right? We've got a negative skew here. So that suggests that the markets, um, uh, volatility-wise, it's more in a, a, a contango environment, which is a normal, normalized uh, environment. And if we look at the back month skew comparing August and September, uh, we're deeper in the green. So we're out of the red danger zone. So right now, the market's and sentiment have clearly improved this past week. So they're just waiting on the go ahead by the Fed and the Q2 first pass. If the Q2 first pass is in the green uh, for Q2 GDP and the Feds come in at 75 basis points, but they seem to be a little bit dovish or neutral, I think we're gonna get a bounce this week, all right? If they do anything other than that, I think it's gonna be rolling over. And if we look at bonds, bonds were up strong on Friday. Look at that move right here, 
And that suggests that the markets are seeing a weaker 2023. When the 30-year bonds are moving up like that, that means interest rates are moving lower. And when interest, interest rates move lower, that's not a vote of confidence of the economy on a go-forward basis, okay? Um, in fact, the Fed Fund Futures is expecting interest rates to rise through the end of this year, and then starting in 2023 in Q1 or Q2, the Fed's going to be forced to start cutting rates again, believe it or not. You know, it's kind of like the arson is starting the fire, and then they look and show everybody how they can put it out again. That's kind of what the Feds are doing. They're just all these reindeer games, cutting, raising, cutting, raising. They're they're actually causing more agenda in the markets than just, you know, if you left it to its own devices. So this is a little bit about what's going on right now uh, in the bond market. And let me just switch over to interest rates, and you'll see what I'm talking about here. Interest rates are going down as bonds are going up. You can see that big gap lower, how we took out the 50 EMA. We've moved down lower. We'll probably come down uh, around the 2.5 area north of the 50, or the 200 EMA. All right? That was my original high-end target for interest rates when we moved up slightly above it, and now we're just giving it back up. Okay, So that is not a vote of confidence for the economy as we go into 2023. And of course, if we look at the dollar, it's down a little bit on Friday. You can see how it's just slowly moved down, right? We hit that peak there, um, and a lot of the dollar is the dollar index. It's not the dollar. This move down lower could be uh, a little bit of an ABC pattern where this is an A leg down because this is an Elliott Wave 5 up right here. So it could move down, and then we're going to come back up, maybe test the highs and roll back over again. We don't have any divergence here, so that would suggest any movement lower is going to hold up, and then we're going to move back up again. Uh, but it, it moves based on where the euro, yen, and pound go, even though the Canadian dollar and the Swiss franc and the Swedish krona are part of the U.S. dollar index. The euro, yen, and pound probably make up about, I would say, almost um, 80, 85 percent of the dollar index, really. So if the euro gets stronger with higher interest rates and the economy starts to pair out, then you'll see the dollar move lower. But if the euro starts rolling over and going back to parity, um, parity again with the dollar, then um, you're going to see this dollar moving up, right? Uh, and if we do look at the euro, just so that you could see the euro is moving up right here off of these lows, and we're challenging this area here. The only way I would want to be bullish the euro is if we come up over the 50 EMA, hold it, and then start moving higher. Then the challenge will be getting up over 107. Right now, the up upside challenge with the euro is going to be around 104 105 okay so it's a little bit about what i'm seeing in the euro and of course if we come down and look at gold it's been a dead instrument or a dead asset for a while my original target for gold was right around 1760 all right then we came down and we made a new low right down here um on um i think it was thursday the, the 21st and then, which was down around 1678, we may run right back up here again to around 1760, 1770, something like that, and then roll back over again. You can see the 50s cross the 200 back down. So we're in a bearish chart on gold, and it's going to be the same for silver. If we look at silver, you can see the 50s been below uh, the 200 well back since May of this year, uh, and we're just bouncing along on the bottom. Now, taking a long position in silver may not be necessarily that bad. I don't see it going much lower, okay? The risk of a bigger move now is more upside risk than downside. So for those of you contrarians out there, and I like the trade as well as possibly looking at silver to the upside, at least back up over 19. Right now it's sitting at 18, okay? And then of course, if we look at energy and if we look at oil, um, Russia and Ukraine, they're playing havoc on it. I said it would come down, test the 200 EMA. We actually broke it, all right? And we're sitting at about 90, uh, 9509 right now. Um, I do believe that energy is probably going to slowly whittle its way back down into the low to mid 80s, uh, but it could jump up at any time based on what happens in Russia and Ukraine and what Russia does with their Nord Stream uh, gas pipeline because it'll roll over into oil. Uh, as well. But for now, um, I think oil is just, it's its um, kind of reached its peak and it's just going to be very choppy. For our members, we have a special way of trading oil, uh, which can be profitable. 
um, and a little bit easier to manage than just taking um, swing trades or position trades in oil because it's very hard to predict with the geopolitical events that are going on right now. Um, and that gas, well, that gas, you want to be long natural gas. Okay. Uh, we're getting this, this move here. It could be like a cup and handle um, where it moves up, curls down, and then goes back up another 10%. We've, we've been long that gas for a while. Um, I do like that long. Even if Russia doesn't curtail nat gas in the Nord Stream 1 pipeline, um, it's just going to be in heavy demand because we're going to have extremely hot summer. Weather forecast is hot, not only here, but all across Europe. So they're going to be burning natural gas as fast as they can. So we want to be long nat gas. So that's just another thing that we're, we're taking a look at here. All right, everybody, that's a real quick overview of the markets at a high level, some of the major asset classes. Members, I will see you this Sunday evening for our weekly market watch. Otherwise, everybody else have a really great weekend. If you're not a member, I highly encourage you to come in and check us out. We're, we're having fun this year. Take care, everybody. Ciao now.